there is an interesting diagram called the uh, hertzsprung russell diagram and uh, this diagram shows that uh, there is something called the main sequence of uh, stars so can you see this picture yeah so this is uh, this main sequence of uh, stars so most of the times it is uh, expected that if you have a high temperature uh, then it will be uh, if the temperature is very high then it will have less uh, luminosity and uh, sorry if the temperature is very high it will have high luminosity if the temperature is less it will have uh, less luminosity as you know from uh, black body radiation the temperature is uh, related to color so if you have a white kind of a color very bright kind of a color that the temperature will be very high in which case you would expect that it will uh, its luminosity will be very high so this uh, main sequence is supposed to have this feature but then there are some exceptions like this white dwarfs uh, is an exception where they are uh, <coughs> they are very uh, their, their temperature is very high but then they don't emit much light so they're luminous they are somewhat dull stars and then the other extreme you have these giants sometimes they are called red giants or super giants so they have uh, very low temperature but then their luminosity is very high so this uh, that is this region and uh, this region these are like um, exceptions to the main sequence of stars but then the exception is not uh, does not mean that there are very few number of stars like this it turns out that a large percentage of stars uh, will uh, will have would have got their future as white dwarf or probably are going to uh, the future of uh, white dwarf so as uh, we see here our sun is in the main sequence and uh, this is the this is where white dwarfs are <coughs> there now uh, what happens in white dwarfs is uh, that uh, normally in a star uh, suppose if you have a star uh, what happens in star is uh, there is a thermonuclear fusion so you have uh, hydrogens uh, hydrogen and hydrogen will become helium okay so this is your thermonuclear reaction and uh, this is what uh, gives rise to energy and that energy will come out uh, as heat and light energy from the star okay but uh, what happens is after uh, uh, so in white dwarf stars okay so in white dwarf stars um, the hydrogen is used up h is used up there is no hydrogen left okay so what you have is uh, uh, what we have in this is only helium we have helium okay there may be other things but uh, a dominant one is helium okay and uh, let us try to understand uh, this star the typical mass of this star is uh, of the order of 10 power 33 grams and mass density is of the order of a, a kind of 10 million grams per centimeter cube and the temperature is of the order of 10 power 7 kelvin which means this is the mean thermal energy kbt is of the order of 1 kilo electron volts or 1000 electron volts so from this calculation we find that the mean thermal energy which is about uh, 1000 electron volts is much greater than the energy required to ionize helium atoms uh, typically ionization of the helium atom is around 100 electron volts so this is 1000 electron volts so it can simply strip off all the electrons from the helium atoms so we can say that what are the microscopic constituents let's say there are n number of electrons and then n by 2 helium nuclei uh, so n is of course you can uh, 
<laughs> right now I am just saying some n arbitrary n. If there are n electrons, because each helium has two electrons, there will be n by two helium nuclei. So now we can estimate the mass of the star. So mass of the star is uh, n times uh, electron mass plus half n times the helium nucleus will have two protons and two neutrons. Let me assume that the new mass uh, of the proton is same as mass of the neutron, which is equal to mass of the proton. Then it will be four times mass of the proton. And you know mass of the electron is uh, 2,000 times smaller than the mass of the proton. So we can neglect this to, <coughs> to some uh, uh, rough approximation. So this becomes 2 times n times mass of the proton. Now we would like to uh, obtain the number density of electrons. Now number density of electrons is required ultimately to find out uh, uh, what is called the Fermi energy. Okay, So we would like to know what is Fermi energy. So for that first we have to find out the number density of the electron. Now the number density of the electrons is uh, simply total number of electrons divided by the volume and the total number of electrons can be obtained because uh, as we have seen here so from here you can write down your capital n is equal to mass of the star divided by two times mass of the proton so i take that value here and v is nothing but m by rho so i told you here what is the mass and what is the rho so your volume is basically equal to m by rho. So this gives me uh, a value rho divided by 2 times m. Correct. Now rho, as I told you, is of the order of 10 to the 7. And then mass of the proton in uh, CGS units is of the order of 10 to the minus uh, <coughs> 24 uh, uh, or something like that. Then this is these are just order of the magnitude estimates. So this is not grams. This is simply number per centimeter cube. So there are something like 10 power 30 electrons per centimeter cube. So this is the density, number density of electrons in uh, a typical white dwarf star. Now you can uh, you can see that uh, you can write. Uh, the total number, okay, total number as, so you have, uh, you have a phase space, V is the volume of the coordinate space, and 4 pi p square dp is the uh, shell volume of, uh, uh, <coughs> of momentum space, whose momentum is p and p plus dp, and uh, g will be the spin multiplicity factor and the h cube is the cell volume so this is how you get uh, density of uh, uh, density of cells in the phase space and now you integrate this from 0 to pf okay we will get uh, from here i can uh, so from here you can see that uh, uh, this <coughs> this n will be equal to uh, g i can take out v into 4 pi by h cube into uh, p f cube by 3. So this n by v is n. So if I take it on the other side, so I have, um, so take, uh, so from here to here, you obtain by taking this g is equal to 2. That is the spin multiplicity factor. So I know n, I know the Planck's constant. I put in those values. Then I get this Fermi momentum to be 10 to the minus 17 gram centimeter per second. So this is the value of the Fermi momentum that I'm getting. And then you realize that this value of Fermi momentum is, is uh, comparable to the characteristic uh, momentum of the electron where Me is multiplied by the velocity of light. Okay. So this comparison means that the Fermi energy, the Fermi energy should be comparable to the rest mass energy, Me square, because Fermi momentum is compared to Mec, 
and Fermi energy must be comparable to mac square. Now from here, I can, uh, you know, c square, uh, mac square for the electron is of the order of uh, MeV, 0.5 MeV. So typically this Fermi energy is of the order of uh, 10 to the 6 electron volts. Now from here, uh, you can write down this is equal to Kb times Tf. From there, the Fermi temperature, I get it to be 10 power 10 Kelvin. Okay. So you, <coughs> you may wonder that uh, why I did not directly calculate uh, Fermi energy. Why I have calculated Fermi momentum and then compared the Fermi momentum with the electron characteristic momentum. Then I uh, drew the conclusion that Fermi energy is comparable to rest mass energy and I used this fact to say that the Fermi energy is of the order of 1 MeV. Okay, uh, the reason is that uh, since I do not know, uh, we have derived a certain uh, relation between Fermi energy and number of number density earlier, but remember what we have assumed at that time is that there is uh, an energy momentum relation and the energy momentum relation we used was a non-relativistic energy momentum relation. So we assume that epsilon is p square by 2m and that is where the density of states will become uh, epsilon to the power 3 by 2 and then you integrate that from 0 to epsilon f you get a relation between Fermi energy and n. But we do not know whether that uh, energy momentum relation is valid here since we are not sure we are only getting the Fermi momentum. This is something which doesn't have any energy momentum relation assumed in this. So we are going to get Fermi momentum and then we get Fermi energy by this argument. Now this gives us uh, two important uh, conclusions. One is that since the Fermi energy is of the order of rest mass of the electron, the dynamics of electrons are relativistic. So we cannot, <coughs> we cannot use non-relativistic energy momentum relation. This is first uh, uh, important uh, conclusion. And second conclusion is that since Tf is 10 power 10 Kelvin, and we have, sorry, this is T by Tf. So we have already uh, talked about the temperature of the black hole, which is 10 to the 7 Kelvin. And this uh, Fermi temperature is 10 to the 10 Kelvin. So this ratio is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, which means that the electrons are in a state of almost complete degeneracy, which means that its behavior is only going to alter slightly from its t equal to zero behavior because t by tf is very, very small. Okay, so these two conclusions we can draw from this particular result. So now, um, so let me just make one uh, remark here that. Um, So the material which I am presenting here, uh, which, which I am pre presenting in this lecture in the form of printed text is, uh, uh, is taken from a book called R.K. Patria. Okay, so you can, I think third edition, Patria and Puli probably. Okay, third edition. And uh, I, I can recommend you that you please go and read the textbook because uh, we will not uh, spend time in writing because we can do it quickly. Uh, but I will try to spend uh, time in explaining and uh, we will <coughs> we'll try to understand it step by step. But you can read that because m much of the explanation what is written in English in the book, I might not have written it here. So the energy momentum relation for a relativistic particle is given by this. So normally you have this energy momentum relation that is your E square is equal to P square C square plus M square C to the power 4, correct? So this is what is your uh, relation. So you can write this as uh, M square C to the power 4 if you pull that out then you will have 1 plus uh, p square uh, p square by m square 
t square t square by m, m square c square so this is your relation so your epsilon is equal to m c square into square root of 1 plus t by m c the whole square okay so this is the total energy okay but uh, you want uh, you want uh, only energy that you remove the rest mass energy from this okay so let me say that this is capital e square or something so capital e is equal to this and this small e that we are writing is this capital e minus mc square that means that you remove the rest mass energy from that okay so that is your epsilon that is mc square into this is square root of 1 plus p by mc whole square minus 1 okay and then you write down uh, so the velocity okay so this is the uh, velocity of the particle so the velocity is always given by d epsilon by dp okay so d epsilon by dp remember in in non relativistic case okay so in nr case your uh, epsilon is equal to simply p square by 2m okay so what will be d epsilon by dp d epsilon by dp is p by m okay and uh, similarly you can generalize this one so if you have any energy momentum relation this is like kinetic energy of the system so you can write down d epsilon by dp as its velocity and this is given by this so in the limit uh, uh, c becomes very large or this p is like m into v if v by c goes to 0 then this will become 0 and it will simply be p by m like in the non relativistic case so this will go to this in the limit v by c goes to 0 okay so this is an expression for for pv uh, or the velocity of this one so you can uh, <coughs> so using this we can write down the pressure so the pressure of uh, electron gas the pressure of electron gas is given by this okay so this expression you can obtain uh, uh, <coughs> quite generally from uh, from the fermi dirac distribution okay so so we have to we have to deal with uh, uh, <coughs> this kind of an equation so let us let us write that one here So we had uh, okay. So let me just uh, show you this. So you know you have Q for Fermi Dirac distribution is uh, product over single particle energy levels and one plus Z into e to the minus beta epsilon. Okay, so this is for Fermi Dirac distribution, and we have a relation that PV by KT, PV by KBT is equal to logarithm of Q, which is equal to sum over epsilon uh, logarithm of 1 plus Z into e to the minus beta. Now we would like to uh, we would like to write this as uh, as what is called uh, uh, an integration so using the density of states so that means so as we have seen the density of states i'm not going to once again use any non relativistic uh, case so the density of case uh, states i will write it in terms of uh, uh, in terms of what is called so this epsilon will be a function of p so I want to write this uh, uh, integration over uh, over uh, over p. Okay. So if I do that, that will be equal to um, g v 
4 pi by h cube into integral okay uh, we will have logarithm of 1 plus z e to the minus beta this epsilon will be a function of p okay into p square dp that is what it will be correct so this will be into p square dp so gv 4 pi p square dp by h cube is what is our uh, uh, density of states okay so this will go from 0 to infinity in general so i can uh, i can uh, uh, solve this one by uh, <coughs> so you can see that uh, first this g uh, will can uh, volume will cancel and this is uh, g is equal to 2 so g will be equal to 2 so i will have uh, the pressure is equal to 8 pi uh, kbt by h cube okay and then this integral i can do an integration by parts so integration by parts how do i do integration by parts i take this as my u uh, this as my u and this as my v so consider uh, u is equal to logarithm of 1 plus z e to the minus beta into epsilon then du is equal to 1 by 1 plus z e to the minus beta epsilon into z e to the minus beta epsilon into minus beta into d epsilon by d p. Okay, so this is what is my du into d epsilon, of course, or let me write a du by d epsilon is this, sorry, du by d p is this. Yeah, so du by d p is this. Now, my d v is uh, uh, p square d p. So v will be equal to uh, p cube by 3. So uh, this one will become, uh, so the pressure, the capital P, please uh, differentiate between capital P and small p. Uh, I think I have to write this integral 0 to infinity and the same integrand. Now if I do integration by parts, my capital P will be equal to uh, 8 pi kbt, kbt by h cube into uh, first term will be p cube by 3, that is your v, into logarithm of 1 plus z e to the minus beta epsilon. And of course, this one is uh, going from infinite 0 to infinity, that is its uh, this thing and uh, then you have minus uh, 1 by 3 uh, 1 by 3 into integral 0 to infinity uh, you have of course minus beta so that will be a beta here and so this z e to the minus beta epsilon when I take it to the denominator I will have 1 by z inverse e to the beta epsilon plus 1 into, I write this as p into uh, d epsilon by dp, p into d epsilon by dp into p square dp. So I can write it like this. So this is like, um, uh, so this, this beta, this beta and the kbt will cancel. Okay, and uh, this 1 by 3 will remain, and this 8 pi p square dp and all this integral can be considered as uh, uh, integration with this probability distribution. So that is why you can write this. Uh, <coughs>
Okay, just give me a minute. I, I can get it. Okay, let me just uh, <clears throat> okay, I will I will share it again. Okay, so I think uh, yeah. So I think uh, <coughs> this is what I meant by one one by three into n by b, uh, and you have this this average average behavior is uh, this averaging is essentially um uh, taking over the probability distribution of this one okay so that is uh, if you take any average this averaging means um you are taking the so any averaging so let's say average this averaging whatever is there in this averaging that means this is uh, 8 pi v by h cube into integral 0 to infinity and you have this uh, probability of that epsilon into whatever that dot 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 into p square d okay so this is general this is what we have observed in this uh, uh, in this particular case as we have seen here and we derived it finally so this the, this part of the this one will become zero as you can notice and this is uh, this is your p of e probability of okay this is another another p that is coming here so i will say the probability of e and this is your dot 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 that I have represented. So this is uh, momentum and this is velocity. So PU average. Okay, so that is uh, essentially what uh, we are writing here. That uh, the pressure is given by one third of n by v into this. So which is expressed here. But here you have taken this. Um, uh, you can say that uh, we have used this. Uh, uh, zero temperature thing okay so that means uh, we are now trying to now trying to uh, write it as a zero temperature thing that means uh, <coughs> uh, that means here we have uh, we have taken your probability of epsilon 
uh, is equal to 1 for uh, p less than p f and 0 if it is p greater than p f. So that is why I'm going to integrate this from 0 to p f in this one. Now, what is this expression? So this expression is our uh, p by m expression. Uh, that is p a u expression. That is what we have got here, right? So this is your d epsilon by dp or u expression. So I put it and um, I put that one here and then I get uh, So I get that uh, expression. Now to solve this one, you make a change of variable. Now we introduce uh, a dimensionless variable, theta, such that p is written as mc sin h theta. Now you know that uh, Fermi momentum is of the order of mc. So it is taken as this, which makes uh, u should be c tan h theta. And now you substitute these two equations uh, and then uh, you can show that this n uh, will become this this quantity. So there is a variable called x. I will tell you what this variable is. So in terms of that, you can say that this uh, pressure, okay, will become sine hyperbolic for four theta into this. So when you do this calculation, you will get uh, <coughs> you will get this in terms of some function a of x or whatever is the integration result, I am calling that as a function. Now let me tell you what this x is. Uh, x is something which uh, uh, we can define it like this. So x is equal to sin h theta p f, because that is the limit of the integration, which is p f by m c. And we already know what is p f, which is given by this. It is related to h by m c. And if you can recall, this is a uh, famous uh, uh, Compton, Compton wave. Compton wave. Okay. So this x is uh, x is uh, uh, written in terms of a Compton wavelength. So you can see that this uh, uh, ax is uh, a function which is given by this this one. This is uh, the result of the integration of this one. Okay, so I, I request you to try this integration. And if there is any difficulty, then we can come back. So now you can see that uh, we have been able to do this integration. And then we got this uh, a of x to be equal to this in terms of the. So remember, x is related to this uh, uh, theta f, because x is nothing but sin h theta x. When you make a change of variable carefully, then you will get that as an x here. And then integration when you are doing, everywhere you have to substitute that x, and then you will get this function. Okay, so a little bit of algebra uh, is involved, but uh, nevertheless it is doable. Now this function has this kind of a behavior. If you carefully look at this function, for x very, very uh, less than 1, then you have this kind of a, a behavior. And if x is much, much greater than 1, then it has this kind of a behavior. Okay, So th that is the solution uh, for the pressure is in terms of this behavior. OK, so we can, uh, we can ask a question that uh, how do we make uh, uh, use of this? So as, as we have seen here, this uh, uh, <coughs> x is written in terms of h by mc. OK. Uh, now you can write this. This is what our, uh, basically, this is your uh, uh, pf by mc. OK. And we have pf to be equal to this 3n by 8 pi 1 by 3 into h. OK, then you get this h by mc. Now you write down this 3, uh, this n. Suppose you write this n as capital N divided by V. 
and what will be v v will be nothing but n divided by uh, r cube correct if you assume that uh, uh, r is the r you can say this is if you assume that this is like a spherical ball this volume is going to be 4 by 3 pi r cube correct 4 by 3 pi r cube so if you substitute that one then uh, in this expression if you substitute then you will have 3n divided by 8 pi into 4 by 3 pi r cube to the power 1 by 3 into h by mc now this uh, 3 will go it is 9 and then 8 into 4 is 32 pi into pi is pi square so 9n by 32 pi square to the power 1 by 3 r 3 to the power 1 by 3 will be simply become r now you can see that there is uh, a ratio of the Compton wavelength divided by the radius of uh, radius of this. So you can see that this is the, in some sense, this is like a, a smallest length. Okay, smallest uh, length scale. Uh, smallest length scale. This smallest length scale corresponds to the constituents of the. Uh, are in some sense you can say is a microscopic microscopic length scale of relevance and this r of course is the largest length scale or a macroscopic length scale which is the radius of uh, uh, radius of the star microscopic length scale so you can see that this is uh, a dimensionless quantity smallest length square divided by the largest length square and this x somehow can be understood as a relation like this okay now you can also write um, this n as we had already seen this n the number so remember that we had this relation that our uh, 2 times n into mp is equal to m so I can write this n as m by 2m. What is m? m is the mass of uh, the star and mp is mass of the proton. So if I substitute that one here, then I get this x as 9m divided by uh, <coughs> 32. Again, there is a 2 here coming. So 64 pi square mp and this one. Now you can see that um, uh, now you can see that uh, this constant or whatever that uh, n is also something like that. This m is like a, a macroscopic macroscopic uh, mass scale. Okay, in terms of the mass, and this mp is like a microscopic mass scale. Microscopic mass scale so this again is like a, radi a ratio of a macroscopic mass divided by a microscopic mass so now you can see that um, uh, if you look at uh, okay so <clears throat> so let me just look at this uh, So, uh, you can derive an expression for the pressure. Okay, you can derive an expression for the pressure by using the gravitational. Uh, <coughs> so, there is a gravitational pull which is related to, uh, which is related to the gravity. So, you can say that, uh, uh, so you go back to your uh, expression for this. A of x expression. Yeah, so you can see that uh, this is your uh, pressure. Okay, this is your pressure. So this should be equal to. Okay, so the uh, the thing is, this uh, this should be equal to. This should balance. 
balance the inward gravitational inward gravitational uh, pressure okay so that inward gravitational pressure is related to uh, is related to gravity okay and uh, that is something which uh, uh, you can you can calculate suppose you know that uh, uh, your uh, uh, so you you have gravitational energy huh? it is not visible ah it's yeah, yeah. yeah it is not visible okay i just come back Uh, is this visible now? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So now, what you are uh, trying to do is um, saying that that is equal to gravitational thing. So here, uh, uh, this uh, this expression, you will get something like this. So if you take uh, gravitational potential energy. Okay, so that is given by uh, something like um, let's say some some factor alpha, which is just a constant, into uh, it is proportional to m into m, so m square uh, divided by r. Okay, and it is an attractive uh, gravitational energy, so g m square by r. This is the potential uh, energy. And then you can write down uh, uh, the the pressure uh, up to some radius r as uh, uh, something like uh, so. This can be written as uh, the pressure acting on uh, acting at r into four pi r square. Okay, so this is not a, uh, this is not the pressure, but four pi r square into dr. Okay, so this should be equal to this DEG by DR into R and into DR. But that is what gives you the force. Okay, uh, force in this region is given by the pressure uh, acting on uh, this kind of a area. So this kind of a uh, thing, if you substitute, then you will get uh, pressure as there is an R square sitting here. Okay, so this will become uh, from here if you write down dEG by dr, uh, you will get alpha gm square by gm square by r square, and because of that, you will have uh, uh, one by four pi and r square r square will become r power four. So you have this expression, and all those constants you bring it to uh, on the other side, so you have uh, a balance like this. Now, if you balance it like this, then you can write it in the following fashion. So you see here you have h cube, and uh, then you have m cube c cube. So I can put that uh, h by m c whole cube divided by there is an r cube here that I will pull out. So you can see that this can be once again written as a ratio of uh, Compton wavelength divided by the radius r, say macroscope, microscopic and macroscopic length scales. And this is an energy scale. Okay, so just like we have mass scale here, here we have an energy scale. What is the energy scale? This is the macroscopic energy scale. That is macroscopic uh, energy scale, which is uh, gravitational uh, energy. And this is the microscopic energy scale, essentially the rest mass, uh, rest mass energy.
of electron. Okay, so you can see that uh, there is uh, uh, there is a uh, <coughs> again uh, we have neatly been able to write it in terms of these ratios. Okay, and uh, <coughs> so this is a very important relation. So you can see that. Uh, uh, So you can see that this is this is also called uh, uh, this is also called the mass uh, radius relation. So this is related to mass and radius. Okay, we know that uh, for m is equal to 10 power 33, this one h by m c is given by this. Okay, the argument of this function will be of the order of 10 power 8 because this is what is involved in this argument. 10 power 8. Okay. We may therefore define two extreme cases. One is uh, r is much, much greater than 10 power 8. Okay. If r is much, much greater than 10 power 8, then what happens? Uh, uh, this uh, x, which is the whole of this argument, can be said as it is much, much smaller than 1. And hence, according to the behavior of this function, we take a of x is of the order of 8 by 5 into x power 5. And if you substitute that here, okay, if you substitute that here and then uh, do some uh, <coughs> calculation, just algebra, then you will get this r to be this order. Essentially, it is m to the power minus 1 by 3. Okay, r is m to the power minus 1 by 3. On the other hand, if r is much, much smaller than 10 power 8, which makes the case for x much, much greater than 1. And hence, your a of x should be taken as the other behavior of the function, asymptotic behavior. With that results in uh, the relation between r and m to be this quantity. OK, so this is the relation. So one has to do a little bit of algebra, substitute in that, and then you will see that this kind of a relation occurs. Where this m0 is a kind of a limiting mass, and which is uh, uh, which is given by which is given by this, and this is kind of a limiting mass. That uh, so what happens if m is equal to m naught, then the radius becomes zero. Correct. So what does that mean? That means if um, uh, so, if m is smaller than m naught, okay. If m is smaller than m naught, uh, or m is larger than m naught. Uh, then you have uh, so this this factor sometimes becomes imaginary. That means such a radius uh, does not exist. So this sets kind of a limiting value, uh, which can be which can be approximately written as uh, one point uh, four uh, times uh, mass of the sun. Okay, and this limiting mass is called the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, and uh, this is what um, uh, we get it from uh, application of uh, the Fermi Dirac statistics to uh, the electronic system. Now, here, of course, uh, I want you to recall two things. One is uh, uh, there are some assumptions which we have made. Okay, so first assumption is that uh, uh, we completely uh, we did uh, only uh, t equal to 0 Kelvin calculation. Okay, we did t equal to 0 Kelvin calculation. This is because, this is justified because uh, uh, justification Uh, is uh, though uh, t equal to 10 power 7 Kelvin is uh, a very high temperature, very high temperature compared to compared to terrestrial temperatures uh, 
that means temperatures that we are used to in on the on the earth temperatures but uh, t by tf is of the order of 10 power minus 3 kelvin 10 power minus 3 which implies that uh, the electron electron gas is very close very close to t equal to 0 kelvin namely the ground state and hence and hence the pressure pressure exerted by the degenerate Fermi gas. Degenerate means it is t equal to zero. The degenerate Fermi gas of electrons electrons is high enough to balance the gravitational gravitational <coughs> collapse of of uh, white dwarf stars white dwarf stars and provide stability for billions of years as observed. Okay, so this is uh, what we have uh, seen in our, cal shown by calculation. And of course, second thing is that we have, uh, there are other systems, for example, uh, a similar, a similar, uh, argument uh, is applicable to neutron stars where the degenerate Fermi gas of neutrons balance gravity okay and uh, so there are some cases there are also cases considered where the Fermi pressure of quarks play a similar role. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, kind of an application of our white dwarfs in particular. So uh, anyway, so the calculation is not uh, so the only only point where you have to do some some work is to go from uh, here to here. Okay, some work is needed. So I I request you to try this. Uh, 
Okay, so other than that, I think we have been able to manage <coughs> arguing through all the other steps. So this one you try, and then uh, if you find it difficult, then you please let me know. Then we can uh, we can see, uh, or I can post uh, post the post the details in the next uh, next meeting, or I can share the calculation with you. Okay, so this is uh, my last application in uh, Fermi Dirac statistics, and we have completed our discussion on uh, uh, <coughs> quantum statistics with this example, and we will uh, have to do one last chapter. So this last chapter is uh, essentially, uh, as you can see, that. Uh, I will try to just. Uh, <coughs> so our last chapter is on uh, uh, a few things so far. Okay, so far uh, we have been considering classical statistics, classical or quantum statistics. Classical or quantum, but there are two things that we are considering. One is uh, uh, the system is always in equilibrium. Okay, so the system is in equilibrium, and then the constituent particles are non-interacting. Okay, you take any uh, example that we have studied. These two features are. There in that, whether it is a classical system or quantum system, we have considered ideal gases in quantum system, whether it is a Bose gas or a Fermi gas. We don't consider any interactions. Okay, so this is, in some sense, all the four units that we have studied. We did not consider interacting system. We did not consider non-equilibrium system. So in this chapter, we would like to study. Uh, one aspect of bringing in interactions, namely phase transitions. Okay, phase transition. Phase transitions occur as a competition between. Uh, so phase transitions occur because there is a competition uh, between some kind of an attractive interaction. Attractive interaction between between particles and uh, thermal result. So entropy, uh, entropy and <coughs> energy. So we have to understand. Uh, so this is uh, essentially. Uh, what we will have to study with the bringing in interaction. And then we also have to study uh, what is called, uh, so the other issue is that we go out of equilibrium. That means we ask what happens in non-equilibrium. Okay, so in non-equilibrium, we, uh, <coughs> we will study uh, Essentially, something like a diffusion, diffusion phenomena, and of course there is another phenomena that we do called Brownian motion, diffusion and Brownian motion. So one of uh, so in phase transitions, we will there is one important uh, model for magnetic phase transition. Called Ising model. This is a model of interacting spin system. So Ising model, and then there is a general theory of second order phase transitions called Landau theory. Landau theory of 
uh, continuous phase transition. That means second order phase transition. Okay, so we have to study these uh, uh, these things. So I, I I have asked for only two more lectures. So what I will do is I will try to uh, share some uh, some videos dealing with the basics of this phase transition, which I will not discuss in the class. So I will straight away uh, discuss Landau theory of phase transitions. And uh, you please see the videos at your convenience uh, <clears throat> before uh, next Wednesday, so that we will straight away uh, talk about uh, mean field theory or the critical exponents, how to obtain the critical exponents in the Landau theory of uh, candidate. And you can get, uh, so I will show, uh, I will share two videos. Uh, both of them are from thermodynamics, but uh, they are they are basically my lectures, which I gave in some other context. So I will share them uh, with you. So please go through that. So you'll understand thermodynamic aspect of this phase transition. And then we straight away come to critical exponents and how to get the critical exponents from the Landau theory. OK? And uh, then uh, we will, uh, so I will try to also present parallelly as an example of uh, one of the model as an Ising model. So I expect that these two things I will uh, cover in uh, one class. And then in the next class, I will try to, of course, not going to too much details. I will talk about diffusion by means of uh, random walk. Okay, so this is a model. So let's talk about random walk and then a approximation of uh, modeling diffusion through random walk. And then talk about the uh, Brownian motion. So I think uh, two lectures I will try to complete this. So this is uh, one part or whatever is remaining. And if you, if I can get one more lecture, uh, then I will try to amplify on certain things which I will I will try to summarize a few more things. On. Then uh, I want uh, I, I I have so we have completed one internal test, and uh, I want to I want to send you some uh, some five problems which you can do it at uh, as a what is called a take home exam, and then submit submit that. Uh, uh, maybe in one week time. So that will be considered as a second internal test. Okay. So this will be the summary of how how the course will end. Okay. Uh, any any questions? OK, uh, if you have no questions, then uh, you can leave because uh, we have you have another class. <laughs>